Okay, so uh, we just talked about how there is a lot of evidence that exercise is very helpful with chronic axial neck pain to reduce the pain, improve the strength, the range of motion, improve the function, uh, and re reduce the disability and reduce the fear avoidance. Well, there's a million things we can talk about about how this works, but let's talk about some of the really fun ways. This is really, really fun for me. It's amazing what they've done in Scandinavia. They've done some really nice biopsy studies and oxygenation studies, and they've shown that individuals with chronic neck pain have atrophied neck muscle fibers. They have mitochondrial damage. They have lower trapezius blood flow than normal controls. They have reduced tissue metabolism, reduced small vessel capillarization to the muscle fibers. They have a reduction in the concentration of their sodium and potassium pumps and their ATP in the neck muscle biopsies. This is associated with muscle fatigue and pain. Um, strength and endurance training increase sodium and potassium pump concentration in the neck muscles, and they improve the capillarization to the individual muscle fibers. That's big. This is happening while we exercise in addition to the other things. And a really nice study, again, out of uh, Scandinavia looked at individuals with and without chronic neck pain who rode a bike with relaxed shoulders for 20 minutes. They weren't working their neck or their arms, just using their legs to ride that bike. And the patients who had the neck pain reported significant reduction in their neck pain while they were riding the bike. How interesting. Well, we also know that if we um, focus on something else, then our pain can be reduced. But additionally, both the normal subjects and the patients with neck pain during the time they were riding the bike had increased oxygena oxygenation to their trapezius muscles, even though the muscles were relaxed. And they used a near-infrared spectroscopy that's sensitive and specific for oxygenation to demonstrate this. And as they rode for the 20 minutes, there was a linear increase in the level of oxygen. And funny, the normals were able to maintain that oxygen level in the trapezius muscle and keep that blood flow going for two minutes after the test, the, the riding, the 20-minute ride, compared to the chronic neck pain patients who rapidly lost their oxygenation and went back to a, a more hypoxic state uh, than the normals. Strength training does elicit hypertrophy of neck muscle fibers. It transforms catabolic metabolism to anabolic metabolism. It increases growth hormone and testosterone, and it increases insulin-like growth factor in, generally in the system, which are positive uh, changes. Um, people with neck pain have a high cytochrome C protein level in their mitochondria, which is associated with apoptosis. And when people strength and endurance train, the, uh, this protein is reduced, uh, suggesting that, that the metabolism is changing. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, Cotty, who's done a lot of work here, has shown that strength and endurance training increased capillarization to the muscle fibers, which is big. So there's a lot going on histologically and in the micro milieu in addition to the macro milieu. Um, pain may be modified because of the peripheral nociceptors. If we are increasing the, the micro blood flow and the macro blood flow, we're increasing the circulation and the metabolism, we're clearing the inflammatory products and the potential irritants and all those um, chemical contributors. Uh, this may be associated with muscle tissue healing, and the other tissues around the area will also strengthen. There is neural adaptation with training. This is really interesting stuff that when we first start training any particular muscle in the body, we may not really be getting stronger. We may be just changing, changing how our motor units fire. We may be recruiting uh, higher threshold motor units. We may be more uh, syn synchronizing our motor unit recruiting, and we may have improved control over our motor units. Some of it is learned. Some of the strength that we get is learned. And um, with increased motor control, we see increased efferent activity, reduced ascending afferent activity, those uh, central sensitization situations with the hyperfiring uh, functional MRI studies that have, that have been documented lately. We can inhibit those with exercise. Increased strength and control improve muscle stability of the neck. They reduce the strain on the ligaments and the joint capsule if we're holding everything up better. We're working better as a unit and um, 
We also see, uh, again, a reduction in that hyperesthesia or central sensitization, and we actually see endorphins in response to exercise, systemic endorphins, which make us feel good. Um, just to wrap it up here, uh, the gate, we're all familiar with the gate control theory of pain that was proposed in 1965, suggesting that exercise and movement simulates the, the muscle spindles, the Golgi tendon organs, the mechanoreceptors around the joints, which increases the activity of the efferents, inhibits the ascending uh, afferent pain pathways, and, uh, and inhibits those small fiber diameter uh, fibers, reducing all this things that's going on in the dorsal horn and the other areas of the brain that are responsible for pain. And then in 1990 and since then, it's been shown that active training and exercise do, do in fact, not, not just as a theory, but do in fact activate the descending pain pathways and inhibit the central sensitization. And training also changes, uh, studies show, our beliefs, our behavior, and our fear. So if we train, we feel better, and we feel more confident and comfortable, and we do more things. Um, Jerome will get much more into this. this is, I think this is my last slide, that emotions and fear do exacerbate pain. And conscious exercise of areas associated with pain does diminish fear. And this has been shown not just in this study, but in other studies. So there's a lot going on histologically, physiologically, neurologically, and psychologically with, with pain that can explain why we feel better when we exercise. Thank you very much. So my problem is the last time I tried to explain the mitochondrial changes and the changes in the Golgi apparatus to my patients, they thought I was looking a little crazy. So I thought I had to figure out a way to explain to somebody with a painful disc or painful facet joints or both, how could exercising really help them? And as we've said earlier this morning, they came in with an MRI, they have two degenerated discs. Um, they might have a herniation. How in the world could exercise help them? So um, I tried to figure out a, a paradigm that I could use to explain to the patients and convince them. And basically what I tell patients, and I didn't make a slide of this, but basically what I try to explain is, and this is a, sort of how I say it, is that if you took away all the muscles and all the ligaments from the neck, and try to just put and separate it out the way the discs were interwoven with the vertebral body. If the, if the structures are normal and the balance is normal with the normal cervical lordosis, that stack of discs and bones would support and stay there and not fall over. Now I'm exaggerating a little bit to make a point to the patient. And then I say, but then if you have an injured structure, a disc that's now somewhat narrowed, maybe one side more than the other, that you have some degree of muscle spasm and you no longer have that nice uh, shape to your neck and you took away again all the supporting ligaments and muscles and you just balanced a, a neck, it would fall apart. And I talked to them about, if you, I could sort of say it with a, with a stack of checkers, for instance. So once they understand that, then I say, well, now your neck muscles and your ligaments and other supporting structures are like guy lines, guy wires that help that neck stay in place. And when the neck deep structures are altered in their alignment, you now need to bring into play all those other supporting structures. So they need to be strong and they need to work to help balance your neck. Now that's a little, I don't say it in those exact words, but basically some variation or other of that explanation seems to make sense to patients and it seems to at least give them some idea of why doing exercises, getting stronger and getting more endurance is helpful. So that's how I try to do it. And you know, part of the trick in establishing relationships with patients is saying the same thing that you've said a hundred or a thousand times and make it seem like it's fresh and new and maybe you just came up with it. So th that's the art form of some of, of, of medical practice is trying to build that rapport through making sense to the patient and making it seem like this, what I'm telling them is just for them and I've never said it uh, before. But that, that's what we try to do. So as I said earlier, exercise is medicine. 
And if we think about exercise as a prescription and as medicine, we'll get further that if we think of it as a byproduct to the um, medications we give or the referrals we make. So, and I like what Carol and um, Mike said, that basically we're talking about strength and endurance training, and then we might add to that stretching when uh, totally appropriate. And our goal in the patient is to improve their function and reducing their pain. But remember, and Carol showed a nice slide of that, that the, the correlation between how much someone hurts and how impaired they are, is the, that correlation is only modest at best. So you can have people with minimal pain or minimal structural abnormality that are severely impaired, and the converse, people with severe deformity that are working full time and have a little bit of pain. So what are some of the mechanisms for the reduction of pain and improvement in function? Uh, Carol alluded to a few of them, but basically what we're emphasizing is improvement in the strength and endurance, and Mike showed that slide of me uh, on that slide with the, that's how, no. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, decreasing the fear avoidance, improving coping abilities, and then some effects that we really don't um, understand. And Carol and Jim, uh, Carol Hardigan and Jim Rainville published a paper in, in uh, Spine several years ago about some of the things that might happen, and that includes, and I'm going to, uh, alteration in the peripheral stimulus, that's what I was alluding to. We're not really altering the peripheral stimulus necessary. We're sort of necessarily, we're sort of building up the supportive structures around. Uh, changes in the neural stimulus thresholds, changes in ascending and descending pathways, and of course, changing uh, the brain, endorphin, et cetera, and then of course, uh, the changes in psyche. The, uh, the uh, interpretation of the afferent stimulus is very important. Uh, this, the, the same amount of pain intensity can have very different meanings if somebody knows their pain is from cancer versus the pain is from a herniated disc or a knee problem. And there's something about the spine that's different from other body parts. And Carol and I have discussed this in the past, and we keep meaning to write about this, but we never seem to get to it. But you've heard of people who are called the spineless bastard, or um, there's many, many phrases from Shakespeare on that talk about the spine in this way. Uh, and there's, there's, you know, you're a pain in the neck. Well, you never really hear about anybody who's a hipless bastard or they're a, you know, you never call the person a pain in the knee. So there's something different about neck pain and back pain I th that, that we understand on sort of a visceral level. So the, the interpretation of what's going on does have importance. The same intensity of pain from cancer has a far different effect and interpretation than the same intensity of pain from a bad hip. So. Uh, so we'll go through some of the briefly some of the models. So how can this happen? Well, certainly strength and endurance training, uh, and that, that is where I think of as the compensation model, where the, the strengthening the muscles, uh, stretching things that are too tight, compensate to for the injured structures uh, more deeply. So discs, discs. Why do discs hurt? Discs hurt when the internal nerve endings, the internal nociceptors, become stimulated by load, and the load can be uh, exacerbated by poor posture. Mike made a nice statement about the changes of the load on the neck in terms of good posture versus bad posture based on the, the weight of the head. Well, if we can get the patient to restore normal posture and then give them the strength in their supportive structures, then that can decrease the load on the discs and thereby decrease the stimulation of the internal nociceptors of the disc. The same thing is true uh, with facet joints. So increased strength, increased endurance, increased improved posture will allow people to somewhat offload uh, the, the structures that are abnormal. And that's, I think that thinking of that as a compensation paradigm where muscles stronger, more longer, better endurance and flexible when necessary uh, lead to improvement. So the, and basically that's a pretty simple model to think of. So I like to think of it as a micro malalignment. That is to say, if you look at an x-ray, well, yeah, sure, you might see some uh, loss of the uh, cervical lordosis, but you don't really see big uh, malalignment. So these are little micro 
uh, malalignments that, occur, that increase the stresses on the discs and the facet joints, and repetitive poor stimulation causes more and more pain. You set up an inflammatory cascade, and the patients feel worse. So again, that, just to repeat that in sort of a, um, a more linear fashion, the di discs or facet joints are injured, disrupted in some way. Their shape and relationship to uh, superior and inferior articulating uh, components or how the disc supports uh, the head and neck um, are disrupted. This, leaves to, this leads to some form of peripheral nerve stimulation, nociceptive pain, and some micro malalignment due to the loss of structural integrity. And the, and the more people are in that position, if their muscles are too weak, the muscles are not able, Mike alluded to this, if the muscles are too weak and have no endurance, they are not able to provide the support for these injured structures, and then they hurt more and compound the underlying pain. So our goal with exercise strength and endurance training is to give the patient the strength to maintain those postures that Mike showed us. When we see the, we, it's very easy to tell a person that they're sitting or standing slumped. It's a far different thing to get them to maintain good posture, the uh, chest up, shoulders gently retracted, chin gently back posture requires endurance and some strength in those structures. So the continued stresses with abnormal posture lead to continued pain, and then things get worse in the paradigm that I talked about uh, earlier. So basically, um, a lot of the stuff I will not repeat, they will be in the slides when they're handed out, but basically we're really looking at a deconditioning paradigm in, as one component with muscular, loss of muscular, or decreased muscular strength, decreased endurance, and decreased uh, flexibility. Now much of this data is from low back pain, and there has been insufficient a uh, study, in fact, for a cervical spine, and certainly virtually no study that's really useful in terms of the thoracic spine. Uh, aerobic conditioning, when you ask people what exercise they're doing, some of them are they're doing aerobic work, they're, going, they're walking, and I don't know how many patients say, well, when you ask them about their exercise program, they say, well, I walk every day. And that's really not going to be sufficient uh, I, uh, to uh, overcome a chronic neck or chronic uh, back problem. I'll talk more, and we've all alluded to, about the improvements in the fear avoidance. Activity leads to improvement in fear avoidance behavior. Yes, I can do it. No, I didn't get worse. And we'll talk this tomorrow about coping abilities. So I think I'll stop here. I think this is a good point to um, uh, move on to uh, learning a little bit more how to actualize some of this in our clinical practices. So Mike, I think you're uh, up next, and Mike's going to sort of take us through the next level of how do we actually accomplish some of this. But basically, again, my message uh, is that com we, we now understand better the physiology uh, and the biomechanics, and one of the things we need to do is find models in our own head that we can use to convey to the patient how important it is to get strong and to g develop endurance. So Mike is going to talk about some of the specifics of how we can get from this theoretical basis back to practical application. Thank you. It's kind of the presentation I gave before with less slides and a little slower, so just oh, to be fine. 